What's up, EC? Come on, guys. How is this service today? Are you guys ready to rock? Come on. I need to feel it. This is going to be an incredible Sunday. You know, from the whole team here and the whole staff team, we just want to say welcome to church. My name is Quincy. I am the executive pastor here, and I get to be able to bring the incredible honor of bringing the word today to you. I love it. Our pastors, our lead pastors, Jonathan and Natasha, are in TDOT in Toronto. Someone said they'd never heard that before. I said, well, then you're just not cool. I didn't say that to them, just jokes. I think it was actually a staff member. They may be in the room. Awkward. Um, They're in Toronto at C3 Church right now, bringing the word right there. And so our blessings, obviously, to Toronto, to Sam and Jess Pickens, the pastors out there, incredible uh, friends of our church and friends of the house and friends of Pastor Jonathan and Natasha. So that's where they are. I get to bring the word for our third week of Stranger Times. But before we jump into it, I need your help. We have two other locations that need to hear a huge shout out to our downtown and to our north campus. Come on south, give a shout out. They're losing their brains right now. They're losing their brains. You know, I had to say that because I've been up in the north quite a bit and they don't get to hear that, that cheer that, as loud as we do down here. So it's kind of just like an awkward silence for a second. And, um, and you know, it's usually Pastor Jonathan screaming and, um, ah, you know, and so I just kind of wanted to let them know that we're, we're loving. We love you guys. We're excited about what's happening in the north. Yeah, last, yesterday, Pastor Jason and the crew up there went and blitzed the neighborhood with some door hangers. And, uh, you know, they, they were just, they were crushing that out. And we, we just love what they, they've been doing, the team up there. They, they serve so much. It's an incredible honor. And even just what's happening at downtown at the Globe Cinema you know, we, we launched that two weeks ago, and there was over 300 people there. Come on. Come on. It was, it was crazy. We settled in a little bit less than that, but God's been doing some incredible things, and we're excited about what he's doing across the city of Calgary. And so I, I, got, I got to stop. I got something to say today, and um, it's a little bit different than that. And so with Stranger Things, we're in the third week of this. We started a series of talking about the Stranger Things, uh, sorry, Stranger Times, you can tell that Stranger Things came out on Friday, because I'm calling the series that. Um, Stranger Times, and really what this series is about is just looking at the times that we are. You know, there's been so many things going on, and I won't get into them all. You've heard a bit from Pastor Jonathan over the last few weeks about that. But, you know, nuclear war is so close to happening. You know, if, if you follow the news, or if you're like my wife and don't follow the news and just ask me... Um, that's what's kind of going down. There's a lot of things happening in the world. You know, there's even um, predictions of the end of the world. And just so you know, it hasn't happened. The first prediction was on September 23rd. That, that, that didn't happen. And then the, the second prediction was on October 15th. And that was when we launched the series. I didn't know that. And um, that didn't happen. And the next one, now they've revised it. And the guy who started these predictions doesn't really want to say that this is his prediction, even though he told someone else to say it. And now it's November 19th. So we're just going to, you know, we just know that that there's no one that knows the end of the time. No one knows that, but we can identify the signs. And we can know that we're always living with the posture that Jesus is going to return. And so something that we believe at Experience Church, it's so important, it's actually part of our beliefs, is that we do believe in the second coming of Jesus. We believe he's coming. We don't know when exactly, but we do know that we want to posture ourselves, prepare ourselves, and get ready for his return. That's what Stranger Times is about. It's about is that really it's just the idea that God is in control, Jesus is coming soon, and what are we going to do in the meantime? What are we going to do in the meantime? You know, and uh, other than Netflix binge watching TV shows, let's pray. We need to pray. Lord, we just thank you today that your spirit is here, that you want to you want to speak to each and every one of us. And so we pray now that the words that you've given me will go beyond just my words, Lord God, and be your words today. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, about, about 12, maybe 13 years ago, I worked in a sign shop. I was a graphic designer, 
And um, it was a sign shop that, that did vehicle wraps and billboards and print stuff and all kinds of different things. And I, I didn't really know what I was doing. And I, I got the job because I was dating the boss's girlfriend. Uh, the, uh, the boss's girlfriend? Wow, that's weird. The boss's daughter. The boss. Whoa. Not that. <laughs> we're not that here, okay? Um, do, do, delete. Um, all right. We'll start this over. I was dating the boss's daughter. And I ended up marrying her. And, um, woo, and so I was working for him. And sometimes the boss would go away on trips. And he thought that it was a really wise idea for him. And sometimes he listens to these podcasts. So we'll see if he is this time. I'm not really sure if he's going to. But um, sometimes he would leave me in charge or partially in charge of the responsibilities of the business when he was away. I was in my early 20s. And, um, and you know, I didn't really know a ton about business at that time or really even just being responsible. Um, but, hey, he let me in charge of his business and his employees and all that kind of stuff. And, and, you know, there was in the back production house, there was this old industrial ceiling fan. Now, I'm talking this fan was like it broke all codes. It was, it was not safe. When you turned it up to full velocity, it had this dirty wobble. And you, you literally, you were, you were not sure. You didn't want to stand underneath it because you thought that thing's going to come off and cut my head off at any day. You're just not sure. You're not sure what's going to happen with this thing. It was like mounting a Cessna airplane prop on the ceiling and turning it up to full speed. It was just psycho. It was a psycho thing. And so when, my bo- when the boss was away, we kind of, we, we, we had, a, I don't know, like an attraction to this fan. And there was something about it and we would turn it on and, and, you know, we wouldn't really use it for anything that you'd use a normal fan for, for cooling off. We just use it for fun. And so we turned it on one day, and there was no variable controls. It was either, str- it was just like a light switch, and it was either crazy or off. That's all it was. And uh, so we turned it on to crazy, and it's get- it gets getting warmed up, and we're all staring at it. It's going, you know, and, and, um, and we're thinking, we've got to throw some stuff into this. We, we, got, we have to throw some things. So, you know, starting our curiosity started really simple. So we, we took some pens, and we just tossed some pens into there. And it just shattered the pens, and we were laughing. We thought that was amazing. And um, then we were like, well, this is boring pens. Like, we got we to up our game a bit. So we went over to the garbage cans that we had, and there was some, some leftover vinyl, some, some adhesive vinyl that you would use to wrap on, like a vehicle or something like that. And it would, we'd roll it up in these big balls and throw them around the office. And so there's one that was probably about the size of like this. And it, we, we took it, and we just tossed it into there, and it just, boom! And it just launched right across, and it hit the wall. And we're like, that's awesome! We gotta do it again. So we started doing stuff. We started throwing plastic into it. And we were being really responsible while the boss was away. Super responsible. And, um, and then, you know, there's a point where after, I, I don't know the, the amount of time, we'll just say there was a little bit of time spent wasted. And um, after we were doing that, we, we started to get a little bit bored and we thought maybe we should up our ante a bit. And so because of the nature of the business, there was utility knives, little box cutter knives, the small ones like this, dozens of them all around the shop. We thought, let's go collect them. We got an idea. And, um, you know, at that point, we weren't really thinking, and we were definitely weren't managing a business. We, we were somewhere else, somewhere in between that, you know, 20 to 25 range as a guy that, do- that doesn't really understand that this is going to be my future father-in-law's, <laughs> future and father-in-law of the business that he's running. But you know what? He didn't even know about this, and so um, that's okay. Um, maybe he will now. So we went and we grabbed all the pens, a dozen of them in our hand, and um, a pens, sorry, knives, and we grabbed them all, all the knives. We were holding on to them, and they're just straight Dollarama, you know, like just cheap as ever. And um, I mean, Dollarama is great if you love Dollarama. Like I, I like crushing cheap things too, but they're cheap quality. And uh, we, we grabbed these pens and the thing's going and we're just like, what are we, wh-? like we didn't even think about the plan after we threw that. You know, like, you know when you're doing that? Like, this is going to be amazing. We just got to throw them and then we'll just figure it out. And so we just took the, just took the knives, chucked them into it. Boom! <laughs> and I, I have to admit you, it, it was amazing. It, it was top, top, top like things of, of ever working there. Um, you know, paychecks were good, but that was definitely amazing. We jumped for cover and I felt like I was legit in battle for that moment, you know, things flying over me, and I could just imagine what it would be like to be a warrior, to be a soldier in that moment, and, uh, you know, it made this crazy crash, and we look up, and, um, you know, knives are destroyed, and there's 
literally razor blades were flying around the place. And uh, it was really stupid. And we noticed one other thing was that one of the knives was stuck into a wall. And we were like, wow, that's amazing. And then we thought, we probably better tone it down. And, you know, that was the beginning of, a, of the journey of having fun and doing some crazy things when the boss was away. Now, you probably all have stories of what you've done when the boss is away. Some of you are probably a lot more responsible and worked very hard than I did. In those moments, I had some fun and we did some crazy things. And really what we pick it up today for this series, this message, is Jesus is telling a parable, a story, a story to the disciples about a master, a boss, and take going away on a long trip and entrusting his wealth, his business, with those servants. And so why don't you come with me over to Matthew 25. If you do not have a Bible, we got some Bibles for you at Guest Center. All those ones in those really bright, lovely green shirts. You can go and talk to them afterwards. They'll hook you up with a free Bible. You can do that. It's going to be on the screen as well. And in Matthew 25, verses 14, it goes like this. And again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one and two bags of silver to another and one bag of silver to the, to the last, dividing it proportionally to their abilities. To their abilities. He then he left on his trip. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earned five more. Come on. You know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to name some of these people just so we don't, we don't forget. We'll call, we call Five Bags Freddy Five Bags, okay? We've got Freddy Five Bags. Then we got Timmy Two Bags. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. Come on, Freddy and Timmy. Come on. They got, they got it down. But the servant who received one bag, one bag, you know, we'll get to his name, dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. You know what I'm going to call this guy? I'm going to call him O'Doyle One Bag. Come on now, if you've got any 90s reference here, Billy Madison, O'Doyle Rules. Yeah, come on, uh, whatever. I don't know, it's just stuff that's going through my head. But O'Doyle didn't rule in this one. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they used his money. Uh-oh, the boss came back into town and the knife is in the wall. The servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master... You gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I've earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's go and celebrate together. The same happened with the servant. The servant who had received two bags, Timmy, Timmy, uh, Timmy two bags, right? That's what we got. Of silver came forward and said, Master, you give me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned Two more. And the same response from the master was, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I'll give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. And then we got O'Doyle. Here comes O'Doyle. Then the servant with one bag of silver came and said, Master, I just kind of feel like he, he would be talking different a little bit too. I knew you were a harsh man. In some translations, it says a hard man. Investing crops that you didn't plant and gathering crops that you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here's your money back. He grabs his bag. It's full of dirt. Dirt's fallen off of it, and he's giving it to Jesus. And this is what the master says. The master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. Come on. What? If you knew I harvest crops and I didn't plant and gather crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit the money in the bank and at least I could have gained some interest on it? That's a good, good thought. To those, then he ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with 10 bags. Come on, Freddie's loving his life now. He's got 11. To those who, will, who use well, what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, who do nothing, 
Even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into utter darkness, outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Woo! Now that's just a nice message, hey? This is not just super comforting for you today. Today, I want to jump into what it looks like for us to lead, to, to, to live in the meantime, in the meantime, while we're waiting for the return of Jesus. The first thing is before we know how to live in the meantime, we need to learn to know what God has done for us in the meantime. There's some things that God has given to us. And this parable, you know, a parable was, you know, Jesus was phenomenal. He was, a brill- he was brilliant on taking deep topics and being able to break them down into a story. You know, I heard someone say that if Jesus was living nowadays, he would be the best filmmaker. Like, watch out, Christopher Nolan. Jesus would be on the scene. And, um, and what he did with parables was just really an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And so this, this parable is telling a story that's, that's really just messing around with everyone's thought process of that day. And so there would be servants, there would be this, and, and really we know from this, this story is that Jesus is the master. And that each and every one of us, whether you're online or you're in a different location, you're in this room, we would be those servants. We would be those servants in, those, in this story. And Jesus comes to this, and you got to just, just imagine this, before we get into this any deeper, i got to tell you this, that Jesus, with all his wealth, invested in the servants. Think about this for a second, that God, God himself, has entrusted and gifted each and every one of us. So much so that Jesus' Jesus's, like, investment strategy is you. Is you. Is you. His return of investment is going to be based on what you do with the things that he's already given you. Come on. And so we get a story where Jesus is saying, I'm going to entrust my servants with everything. I'm going to trust them with my wealth. You know, and I just, I like to imagine this a bit, right? Just play with me for a second as I back up. You know, you got Freddie over here. Here's Freddie. You got Timmy over here. You got O'Doyle. It doesn't even go with any Freddie or Timmy. I know that. It's important. It's important to know that. Um, and I just kind of feel like, you know, they get a page on the warehouse floor to come to the come come up to the top top floor to the boss's office, and he's like, Freddie, Timmy, and O'Doyle, can you come to the office? And they get up there, they line up, and uh, the master comes. And just imagine what it would have been like. It's interesting that the first person that's given money is Freddie. Five bags. Freddie, five bags. He's sitting there. And, you know, you could just think the master's there. Like, it's, it's, probably not, it's probably hard for him to hide these bags. These bags represented 75 pounds of coins. It was a weight measurement back then. So this was no little, like, little small bag. It was 75 pounds. So he sees all these bags behind the master. He's kind of wondering what's going on. And the master's like, hey, Freddie, I'm going on a trip. I'm going on a trip, and I want you to take care of this. Here's five bags. He carries them over one at a time. You know, he gets one. He's excited. He gets two. He's excited. He gets three, four, five. He's, he's starting to count the bags, and he's like, man, I got the good deal here. And, uh, and you know, Timmy, Timmy's over here. He's like, way to go, man. And then he starts seeing the, the other bags. He comes with two more bags for Timmy. Here you go, Timmy. I want you to crush that. You got that. And then a Doyle. There's one bag left. Maybe it's hidden behind the master a bit. He can't see it. And he's already, he's, he's already upset. He's, he's like, this is, this is ridiculous. Like, why was he even asked here to get just one bag? Just one bag? And so he gets the bag, and there's something that's happening up here in this exchange. I don't know if it happened altogether, but I just imagine that he started to look over there and be like, hey, why has he got five? What's going on? You know, like, I, I can carry. Uh, I'm not a weakling. I, I got this. And... Um, and Freddie's like, no, no, I don't, I don't know, man. I don't know. I, I didn't ask for this. And I think sometimes when we read this story at the very beginning, we, we start to get a little bit uncomfortable with this. Because, wait a second, this isn't fair. This isn't fair. Like, why didn't, why, why didn't Jesus just give three to everyone? Why did he do this? And it tells us later on in that scripture that Jesus gave according to their ability. He gave according to their ability. I want you to know something that, 
that, you know, even though in that moment there was a different monetary value that was happening there, that Jesus knew what each person could handle. He knew what they could handle. And so we don't understand why. We don't know the reasons behind all that, but we know that it was according to their ability. The good thing about ability is that ability can be grown. And so we don't know if Freddie was in this position years ago and he was a one bag or he was a two bag. We have no idea, but we do know that it can be grown. And so we see, we see this transaction happen. And even though the monetary value is different, there's something that's the same. And each and every one of them was given an opportunity. They were given an opportunity. And in Ephesians 5, 15 and 16, it says, I think this is going to come on the screen anytime here, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. You know, as we're jumping into this, you need to know that first and foremost, that God has given you everything you need. Everything you need to live in this time right now. If you feel like there's something in you that feels like, I need something more. I need some more security in this. I'm scared of this. You need to know that God has gifted you with everything you need to live in stranger times. He's given it all to you. He's entrusted it with you to believe that you can bring an incredible return on what he's given. And so how do we live in stranger times? How do we make the most of all of these opportunities that God has given us? How do we do that? I'm going to give you a few things on how you can do this. Super practical today on how you can make the most of every opportunity. The first one is you need to watch when to use your gifts. You need to watch when to use your gifts. You need to figure out and be, we've been talking a lot about, like last week, Pastor Jonathan talked about the signs of the times and what you need to be aware of that's happening in our world in this time. But you need to also watch for an opportunity when you can use it. You know, we know this because Freddie was already there. It says right after, in another translation, it says he went immediately and, get, and traded his money and gained five bags. He went immediately. Look, I'm talking, he's standing already in there, and there's things going through his head of where he can invest this, what he can do with this, what he can do with it already. There's something about when you want to make the most of opportunities, that when an opportunity is right there, you don't wait on it. You run towards it. You make the most of it in the season. And I think, you know, watching is one of those things that you can do to be able to be on guard and to watch what you want to do, what God is doing in your life. You know, there's my, my daughter, she's three years old, Alexa, and if you know her, she's a talker. Uh, we've been having this struggle with her eating supper, <laughs> or just eating in general. I, I've, tr I've tried everything. Um, like, you, you can judge me, but we sent her to bed one time, and um, well, maybe more than once, <clears throat> Um, with her not eating her supper, she, it was like after 45 minutes, so give me a break, okay? And, um, you know, now we've done a timer, we've done the combination, we've done take toys away, we've, we've tried everything. She's like a little chipmunk. She just wants to wait with her food in her mouth. She just likes it in there. She's, I don't know what she's doing with it. It doesn't taste like food anymore. Her food's always cold. We feel so bad for her. But, you know, she's been saying this thing, and, and, and what she wants, what she always says is, hey, Daddy, are you watching? Hey, Daddy, are you watching me? And uh, she gets into this thing. Like, it's, it's always about the most amazing things that she thinks. So she's like, she's like, hey, Daddy, Daddy, are you watching? And she's like, this, is, this happened last night. She's standing on one foot. She's like, I can stand on one foot. Are you watching? And I, I feel like watching is like for her is to saying, hey, I, I'm trying to make the most of everything right now, but I want someone to know that they're watching me. I want my daddy to know that he's watching. And we can say right now today that the Lord is watching you, and, but he's waiting for you to do something. He's waiting for you to do something. And I feel like sometimes in Christian world and in the context of stranger times and end times, we always say just wait on the Lord. Just wait. You know, you can watch and just wait. Just wait. Just wait for what God wants to do. And I feel like that's, that's good. We need to wait on God. But I, I kind of feel like it's like, you know, I've been in a church a long time. And my, my dad was a pastor. And so I've seen it a lot. And there's some weird things sometimes we do. Like, 
say, come on, crowd, hurry up, hurry up. We're at like a prayer meeting. Hurry up, hurry up, come on, come on, come on. Hurry up, get over here. We're going to hurry up. We're, we're, we're going to wait on God now. And we're going to turn the music up. We're going to wait. We're going to wait right now. And I feel like sometimes in those moments, that's what we say for the end times, is that we say, hey, you know, you need to watch what's happening, but you just need to wait. Wait and see what goes on. Wait on the Lord. And I feel like it's just the, the change of what the word wait means. There's two ways that you can interpret wait. You can interpret wait by delayed action, or you can interpret it by serving as, a, as an action. And I feel like that's the difference is that when we need to wait on God, it's the difference of being a waiter versus being in a waiting room. And sometimes what we need to do is we need to be active and say, God, I want to watch what you're doing, but I want to jump into it. I want to jump in to what you're doing. So you need to watch what's going on, but you also need to work that gift. I'm going to get there. I'm going to go there today. Work. We don't like that word work. Oh, I got a hard job. I got a hard job. I, I work part time. And I start at 10. It's super hard. Oh, you don't even know the people I deal with. They're so hard. I got a hard job. We don't even know. Now, some of you got hard jobs, and I'll give it to you, okay? But some, most of us don't have hard jobs. And we talk about, I got a hard job. We always talk about that. I got a hard job. We, we, we got to work it. But when it comes to our gift that God has given us, you got to work it. I'm going to give you some challenges today of what it looks like to wait, to watch, and to work the gift that God has given you. And we're going to flip right on over to Genesis 2, 15. We're going to go all the way back and flip the script all the way back to Adam. And in this incredible verse that this is right after Adam is created by the workmanship of God. He got down, he got dirty. God got dirty in the dust and the dirt of our earth and built and created us. And then he goes and he says this to Adam. This is the first thing he asked him to do. He says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to watch over it. Come on. Come on. We are called that when we want to live in these stranger times, we need to work it and we need to watch. We need to work and we need to watch over what God is doing in our lives. What does it mean to work? What does it mean to work the gift in you? What am I even talking about? Well, I'll talk about this. You know, there's, there's some people that are just naturally gifted in sports. I don't like those people. Those people make me really uncomfortable. You know, like Dave Benner, who he's right around here somewhere. That, that guy, I, I, if there's a sport that's invented today, he will be the best at it. It's just the way it is. You know, I, I'm, just, I'm still reading the rules and trying to find a YouTube video. I'm like, what do I do? I don't think I got the right attire. I don't even think I own that. Um, but, you know, there's, there's gifts that God has given us, abilities that God has given each and every one of us. For some of you, you don't even know that that has been a gift that God has given you. For some of you, you don't even understand that that is something God has placed inside of you. Also, in Next Steps, the thing that we always talk about every, every week, in the second week of Next Steps, we go through a, a form where you can find out the spiritual gifts, the God-given gifts that he's given each and every one of, a, of us. In Romans 12, 6, it says, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is encouraging, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. What am I talking about for you? You have to watch and work. What I'm talking about is those things that God's given you that you don't even understand. That he's already entrusted with you before you were even born. He's entrusted with you. Some of you in this room are radical givers that believe in generosity and just want they, they just you're generous and you're generous with your time, with everything that you own. Some of you are just have a high level gift of mercy. And so when you see someone who's hurting, whether it's on a street or if it's a friend, you just give up all your life to go and help that person. For some of you, you there's, there's gifts in this room that you don't even know about. But you need to know that God has given you everything that you need right now. And we see with Adam is that work, we, we, we look at this and we think of work being a punishment. We think of work as being something that's bad. But we, we, we realize that in Genesis, work came before sin entered into the world. The very first thing God asked Adam to do was to work it. 
was to work what he was given. Why don't you go and watch over, take care of the garden. Work it. We need to know that, that working our gifts is not, is not a punishment, but it's what we were destined and purposed for. And so we need to work it, we need to watch it, and we need to watch for what's happening and in our time. And in Ephesians 2, it says, for we are his workmanship. That's God, that's Christ the saying. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. It's as simple as this. I'm just going to break it down for you. Is that, what are we supposed to do in the meantime? We're supposed to work what God's given us because we are created by the work of God. And so when we don't live in a posture of working towards the gift that God's given us, whether that's mercy, that's, that's, that's freedom in someone's life, that's whatever the case is, even using those natural abilities like sports or even just the charisma of a personality, even using those things and not giving them back to God, what we're doing is we're saying, hey, I know you built me this way, but I'm not going to work it. We're actually saying, I, I, I'm, I'm turning my back on the one who worked and built me and created me. And so I know that as we work, God wants to give you the opportunities. He wants to give you the things. So how do we then make the most? What happens when we make the most of these opportunities? You know, you got to work and you got to watch. You gotta, but how do, you, how do you know that you're making the most of them? What happens when they do? What's the product of them? What's the result of them? Well, it's really just a couple things. We learned this from this passage in here is that we multiply. When we work the gift that God has given us, there's a multiplication that comes with that. There's something that multiplies. I, I don't know about you, but I want you to be encouraged that God is a God of multiplication. He's, he's not even just a God of addition. He's a God of multiplication. And he wants to multiply the things that are in your life. I don't care if you feel like you only have one gift right now. But I want you to know right now that's a whole bag of coin. And that's a lot of money. And just so you know that God's given you something, you need to work that. Because he wants to multiply it. He wants to grow it in your life. He wants to grow it in, in the season where you are right now because there's something more. And I think multiplication, this is, this, this is the thing, that, the, the dichotomy between O'Doyle and Timmy and Freddie was maintaining and multiplying maintaining and multiplying. Now, I don't know about you, but if you're ever in a place in your life where you're just trying to maintain what God is doing in your life, rather than trying to believe that, God, you want to multiply, he's going he's to challenge you for more growth. He's going to challenge you to take a step and say, you know what? Hey, you need to multiply what he has done. So what hinders us from making the most of these? I'll tell you this. This is, this is, this is O'Doyle. He gives us the, the the tools and what we need to know that what can hinder us. I'll tell you, the first thing that can hinder us is that when we hide our gifts, we produce fear and laziness. I just I need, to, I need to talk there for a second because I feel like there's some people that are in this room, you've taken a gift that God's given you and you've, you've dug a hole and put it in there. And I feel like today God wants to do some mining. He wants to dig up some gold in your life. Come on. He wants to dig up some silver in your life. He wants to dig up that gift that you've been sitting on that's been in your backyard for a while that you walk by occasionally and you wonder, oh, ooh, I, w- I wonder when I'm going to have to talk about that. I wonder when I'm going to have to see about that. You know what? When you, when you hide the gift of God that he's given you, it produces fear. It produces laziness in our lives. And it produces a posture where we just want to wait, but we don't want to work. We just want to wait and see what God's going to do and maybe something will, good will come out of it but we don't want to work it. We don't want to put the effort into it. I've been there. I've been there. And fear in a doyle, it hijacks, it hijacks all of your opportunities. When you're, when you're afraid and when you got fear in your life, that's what hijacks the opportunities that God has given you. I can know that this, the, we, we jump over to that scripture of a doyle and at the end he says, I was afraid that because you were a harsh man, that you were a hard man. So I hid, I hid it in the ground. Now, you got to think, you got you to give this guy some credit. Like, like it's, it's not that bad what he did. He just took the bag and hid it. He just put it in there thinking for safekeeping. But God's not asking us to live a life of safekeeping. He's asking us a life full of crazy risk-taking for Lord. And that's what he's asking. You know, I remember when my mentors told me that sometimes faith is always spelled, it's spelled R-I-S-K. And I feel like sometimes in this moment that it's, it requires us to take a step out to do something for God rather than to do nothing 
at all. But fear can be that hindrance for us. And when we talk about the end times, there's fear everywhere. You know, there's a doomsday clock. I didn't know this. But an actual real doomsday clock that's done by the, I don't know, the Atomic Scientific Committee or something like that. And it's, it's the worst it's been since 1953. It's at two and a half minutes to midnight. And I guess midnight's death and doomsday. And um, there's, there's fear everywhere around the situation that we are. There's fear around what we believe and what we want to do. But God's just asking us today, would you make the most of your opportunity and not be afraid? Don't hide what I've given you. Don't hide what I've given you. Fear will always keep you from operating that gift. And this, the last thing is apathy. Apathy is the enemy of your destiny. Apathy is that enemy. It is the enemy of keeping you from doing nothing. And I, I feel like that's, that's the thing that, that wants to keep us back is to say, hey, why don't you just play it safe? Why don't you just play it safe and make it easy on yourself? But apathy can be that enemy of your destiny. And you know, you were created for more than just existing. I love this. Sin is what happens when we have too much time on our hands and too little purpose in our lives. Come on. Sin is what happens when we have too much time on our hands but very little purpose in our lives. And so for you, some, some of you just need to get out of that rut is you just need to find some purpose in your life. You need to start working that gift that God's given you. You need to start believing, digging up some dirt that's in your life and say, God, I want to I find the gold in there. I, wanna, I believe there's something more that you want to do. You know, we end this today with really Matthew 25, verse 25 says, I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. I was afraid Look, here is your money back. We know the response, and it reminds me of the same response that Adam and Eve had after they sinned. Let's just read this in Genesis 3, 9 to 10. It says, but the Lord God called to the man. This is the Lord calling out in the Eden, in the garden. Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. So I hid. You know, really, the, the message today is that if we want to make the most of our opportunity, is that we need to learn from Adam. We need to learn from O'Doyle. That God is relentless about us not living a life of nothing. Of living a life in the waiting zone. Your Christianity is not a bus ticket to heaven. It isn't just you go and you, you come to church and you, you meet Jesus and then you sit on a bus stop for the rest of your life waiting for a bus to arrive to take you there. No, it's not. It's the beginning of the process is meeting Jesus and then from there is discovering what you can do to make a difference in the lives of many in our city and in our world. Come on. God wants us to not just live a life that is safe. And I think it just breaks it down in this way is that, you know, there's these uh, sociologists, um, two sociologists found this, they did some research on the regrets of action versus the regrets of inaction. And the regrets of action, the things that we have done that we regret, things that we have committed, are short-term losses. They're short-term blows in us. So if you even take account of some of the things in, you wish you wouldn't have done, maybe there would be the things in the last few weeks. Some of the things that, oh man, I shouldn't have done that. But the regrets of inaction are long-term blows. Almost everybody on their deathbed, deathbed will regret the things that they didn't do in their life, not the things that they wish they could change. And so I want you to know, like Adam, he was sitting there, he was standing there where Eve grabbed the apple, and he, she did an act of committing a sin, the, the commission of sins, where Adam was the omission of sin, where he didn't do anything, he didn't stop it, but received it. The same way worked with O'Doyle, is that he thought he was playing it safe and that was a good thing, and he thought by doing nothing was the best thing, but it was actually the wrong thing. And that he, by living a life of omission, he regret the inaction that he did for eternity. For some of us, God's just calling us to do something. God's just calling us to get up and to do something. You know, I I found this out a few weeks back. 
that I didn't know this. I'm, a, I'm an Apple guy. I love Apple products, not just an Apple, like I want to eat an Apple. Those are good too. Um, I like MacBooks. I like all the stuff that goes with it. And, um, you know, there was a third founder of Apple. We know of the two, you know, we know Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, but we don't know of, and I'm going to mess this guy's name up. We, we don't ever hear about this guy, Ronald Wayne. He's not, me, he's not a brother of Bruce Wayne. Um, two weeks after Apple was incorporated in 1976, Wayne left and sold his 10% stake in the company for 800 bucks. Ooh. <laughs> now 84, still alive, Wayne's shares would be worth $76 billion. Talk about a regret of inaction. A regret of inaction. For some of us in this room, then my challenge for you today is that how do we make the most of every opportunity in these strange times is that you need to do something with the gift that God has given you. You need to dig it up. You need to believe. You need to not live in a place of laziness or fear. But we want to live in a place of multiplication. We want to be fruitful and multiply. And I'm not talking about just making babies. I'm talking about everything that God has given you. He wants to multiply. And he wants it to produce results in people's lives. And so... I just, my challenge for you today is, are you hiding what God has given you to the world? Let's flip the script on what a Doyle did. And rather than burying the, the treasure and the gift that God gave him, why don't we bury the fear and expose the talent that God has given us, the ability of what God's given us? Why don't we flip that around? Bury that fear down there. Get it out of your life and say, Lord, I want to be able to use what you've given me to reach the people that matter the most in our world. There's people that need the message of Jesus. There's people that need to know what God has given to you today. I want you to bow your heads today and close your eyes. You know, as this is a private moment, we just ask that you just don't look around or, you know, don't, don't take account of everything else that's happening. But I feel like right now the master, Jesus, is kind of subtly saying to all of us that he's, he's going to come back at some day and he's going to give account there isn't, there isn't just responsibility given without accountability expected. And so God's going to come back and say, you're responsible for the things I've given you. For some of you in this room, you're not 100% sure what those are. But you know you've been living in fear. You know you've been maybe lazy in the calling that God's given you. And so we, we want to pray for all of you that we would, just, we would operate in the gifts that God has given us. But we also want to pray for the ones that maybe don't know Jesus today. Maybe you come here today and maybe you were invited by a friend. Maybe you've been coming for a while, but you've never made that initial decision to prepare your life for Jesus. Maybe you don't even know what it looks like to be called a servant for Jesus. Maybe you wonder what the gifts that he's given you or he's entrusted with you. Maybe you feel like you don't have any purpose in your life. Maybe you feel like you're lacking the vision of eternity, the vision of the meantime. And I believe that right now the Lord wants to let you know that he wants to give you the gift, and the greatest gift of all, which is Jesus, his son. That Jesus, his son, who came and died for each and every one of us, is the empowerment of all gifts. But he also wants to give you some purpose in your life. And so, as in a couple seconds here, we're going to pray, and if that's something that you want to receive, we're just going to ask you to raise your hand. This isn't something weird. We don't do anything crazy with it. But this is your opportunity to make a, an action step. To say, I'm not going to live in omission, but I'm going to step towards Jesus. And I'm going to put my hands up and believe that God wants to do something. So on the count of three, I'm going to get him to do that. And I'm going to challenge you to do the same. One, if you want to make a decision to follow Jesus, once you raise your hand on three. Two, we'd love to do this together. Three, thank you. Thank you for doing this. Thank you. You can put your hands down if you raise those we see the hands, and together, EC family, why don't we just pray this prayer together today, because we're a family, let's do this all together, Jesus, we want to live with purpose, we want you at the forefront, and we want you to entrust us with your gifts, come into my life, and start me new, in Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you guys give it up 
for everyone who made that decision. Come on, Northwest, downtown, everybody, yeah.